The following podcast is brought to you by the Station of the Cross. Thank you for listening. Change our home life. Change the way we educate our children. It is the presence of God He promised to leave. I will not leave you orphans. Dear brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit is with you. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and His Catholic Church. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network and the iCatholic Radio app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. As always, let's start with prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, through the intercession of St. Ignatius Loyola, we ask that you pour forth your Holy Spirit upon us, a spirit of discernment that we might hear your voice and obey your command. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our topic today is the letters of Archbishop Vigano, A Closer Look. Our guest to help us with this task is independent Catholic journalist Brendan Young. Brendan, welcome to The Catholic Current. Thanks, Father. It's great to be back. Brendan, for for those of our our listeners who might not be up to date, can you give us a a very quick summary of the the timeline and Archbishop Vigano's letters, and then uh, I have some other questions for you. Sure, Father. Well, I think it would be helpful to... Um, briefly describe who is this Archbishop. Um, Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano is is from northern Italy. He was born in 1941, and he was ordained a priest in 1968, and then he was consecrated a bishop in 1992. And uh, the Archbishop's ministry throughout the years was primarily a diplomatic one in the service of the Holy See. So he was involved in different uh, diplomatic missions representing the Holy Father and the Holy See throughout the world, in Iraq, in Great Britain. He was apostolic nuncio to Nigeria. He um, also was a special envoy and permanent observer of the Holy See to the Council of Europe. He held various posts in the Secretariat of State. Um, He was also the chief of personnel at the Vatican, Secretary General of uh, the Vatican City's um, uh, governorate. So, and uh, most recently, before his retirement um, at 75, which is the mandatory age for uh, submitting one's resignation um, in the Church, he was the Apostolic Nuncio to the United States. So he was Apostolic Nuncio from basically 2011 um, through 2016, I believe. Uh, in Washington, D.C. And um, he's um, he, he's not uh, a liberal, but he's also not a traditionalist. He's basically been um, known as a kind of middle-of-the-road prelate as far as um, you know doctrine goes. Mm-hmm. But after his uh, retirement as Apostolic Nuncio, Archbishop Vigano returned to his native Italy and was basically um, quiet, until late August of this year, when on um, Saturday, August 25th, I believe it was, I was in Dublin, Ireland for the World Meeting of Families, right. and this came out um, the night um, of uh, Pope Francis's arrival, I believe, and so the night before that um, the papal mass, after his uh, meeting in uh, Croke Park, this testimony an 11-page document written by Archbishop Vigano came out, and uh, it was dated August 22nd, but it came out on August 25th, and it was basically um, a a very well-documented, so it's not um, ambiguous, it's not generalized, it's very succinct, and it's very telling, this um, kind of a, a series of of well-founded accusations against various prelates in the in the church and the hierarchy, and uh, actually of Pope Francis himself, 
Um, because obviously, Father, this uh, testimony followed um, weeks and months, really, of scandal uh, throughout the Universal Church, all, so all over the world, but particularly in the United States, um, and uh, especially following what's come out about uh, now ex-Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, the former Archbishop of Washington. And so if we're going to look... I'm sorry, just to, to summarize uh, sure. what we know of Archbishop Vigano, I mean, uh, his career, if you will, is uh, certainly uh, broad. Uh, he's got tremendous depth of experience, and he's consistently held positions of very, very great trust and, and responsibility. So uh, it's a mischaracterization to suggest that he's just some crank or... Uh, a right. conspiracy theorist or a fringe figure uh, in any way. Right. I mean, if anyone would be in a position to know, it would seem to me that he would have been in a position to know. Absolutely, Father. Another um, another kind of accusation hurled against the Archbishop after this um, this document, the, the first document came out, was that it was possible that uh, Archbishop Vigano was, was uh, mentally ill or unstable, and that's, of course, uh, not the situation at all, and that's also a very um, old, uh, tried and true tactic among the communists. When you want to um, to silence someone in, in whatever way, when you want to get rid of them or at least their credibility, you accuse them of being mentally ill or mentally unstable. And that's just comrade. The Soviet Union is the workers' paradise. If you're not happy, there must be something wrong with you. Yes, exactly. that's uh, that's uh, that, that's a, it's a very very uh, old tactic, you know, Brendan. As I, I look at the the first letter, and of course, you know, he 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 wrote two. Um, I just want to read a couple sentences from the beginning that stood out for me. He said, "I had always believed and hoped that the hierarchy of the church could find within itself the spiritual resources and strength to tell the whole truth, to amend and to renew itself." Apparently, the Archbishop's view is that didn't happen. And and that's why he acted, and yet there are some who suggested that he's a, he's a disgruntled employee, that he was removed from a higher position and demoted to being nuncio uh, in, in the United States. What do you make of that assertion? Well, Father, in a, in a sense, um, if that were true, I could understand that because. Um, Archbishop Vigano did all that he could to clean up Vatican City State, um, and uh, in doing so, was basically banished by um, the then Secretary of State, Cardinal Tarcisio Bertone. Um, basically, it was Cardinal Bertone who was responsible for sending Archbishop Vigano to the United States. Um, but but we know that that. Archbishop Vigano is a very serious man, and he's um, a devout man, and he's an honest man. And so, what I what I get out of this um, document, out of the first document, this testimony, and also from the second one, of which we'll speak shortly, um, these are words full of love and sincere devotion and reverence for the Church, for the true Church, the Catholic Church. Not the not the humans, uh, the men inside of the church, but the Catholic Church, and I think that anyone reading this objectively or honestly will come away with that same impression that this is um, truly a labor of love and one that was taken at great personal risk on the part of Archbishop Vigano. Speaking of personal risk, I, I, I've seen headlines that he's he's kind of gone off the grid. He told friends that he feared for his life, and he's basically disappeared. Is that correct? That is correct, Father. No one um, no one seems to know where the Archbishop is uh, currently residing, but certainly um, there there are enemies of the Church out there, and there are those who don't want these things. To be, to be published and to be to be known, but we know from from our Lord Himself that that what is hidden will come into the light. So Archbishop Vigano has done a, a tremendous service to the Church by uh, writing, preparing, and then publishing these documents. But unfortunately, he has made some pretty serious enemies by doing so. And I would understand it's it's very sad, but it's understandable why he's 
in a in the undis- in undisclosed location. And prior to uh, to being the the nuncio, didn't he he cause a stir by uh, looking under the rock of Vatican finances when when he was in Rome? Yes, and he did all that he could um, on behalf of Pope Benedict at the time to really rid Vatican City of this um, financial corruption, particularly. Um, for example, he had been responsible for turning what would be, in U.S. dollars, a $10.5 million deficit into a surplus of $44 million in one year. So he's certainly a very capable man, mm-hmm. um, but uh, he he made some enemies in, in Vatican City, and Unfortunately, the the offices of the Vatican aren't, um, we could say, contemplative monasteries, and they're not uh, a paradise of angels. They're they're <laughs> staffed and run by men, and so right. um, those men, even if uh, they happen to be clerics, aren't always the most honest or the most uh, forthcoming or transparent of men. And so Archbishop Viganò did, did what he could to, to try to make Vatican City State a, a more honest and transparent and uh, really a purified place. When we come back, we're going to go through a paragraph-by-paragraph a paragraph detailed discussion of Archbishop Viganò's first letter. We want you to be part of the conversation. Get on the line now at one 511 5483 Stay with us. We'll be right back. The Liturgy of the Hours is prayed three times a day on the Station of the Cross at 5 a.m., 3 p.m., and 9.30 p.m. Eastern. The Liturgy of the Hours is a meditative and efficacious way to foster habitual prayer. It is the daily prayer of the Church, prayed throughout the world by priests, religious, and laity. For details about each hour or more information about the Liturgy of the Hours, visit thestationofthecross.com. A map and a mirror. That's how we can view the life and legacy of Archbishop Fulton Sheen. We can look to Archbishop Sheen's faithful witness to the Lord as a guide, helping us to better share our faith with others. And we can hold up our own faithful witness to the Lord, asking how our lives might better reflect Jesus to a world so in need of Him. What part do you play in this? You would tell your neighbor about a bargain or advise him to see a movie. Does not our Lord mean more to you? than the enthusiasm you might show for a new car, then use the missionaries. Let them save souls for you. Help the Holy Father and inspire souls with the love God loves you. My name is Father Martin Keveney. The bishop is by my side and his holiness is inspiring me every day of my life. There's no better model for priests and missionaries than Archbishop Fulton Sheen. To find out more about the faithful witness of Archbishop Fulton Sheen, visit fultonsheenmission.org. I didn't take my faith seriously, which, which probably means I, I never really got it to begin with. No, I didn't want to give up sin. I mean, the reason we sin is because sin is fun. But it's, it's self-love sin. But it's amazing with God's grace how easy trying to not sin it really is. If you've been away from the Catholic Church for whatever reason, we invite you to take another look. Visit CatholicsComeHome.org today. You're listening to the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. Call into the Catholic Current this hour at 1-877-511-5483. Each morning, the Catholic Current sends out a short survey on the topic for today's show so that you can share your thoughts and any questions you might have. This is a great way to participate, especially if you aren't able to call in live. A few of the responses will be read over the air to add to the discussion, so make sure you sign up to receive our emailed survey at thestationofthecross.com. 
Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTagg of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and his Catholic Church. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network and the iCatholic Radio app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. Our topic today is the letters of Archbishop Vigano, A Closer Look. Our guest to discuss uh, these weighty matters is independent Catholic journalist Brendan Young. Brendan, in the last segment, we looked at uh, the timeline of the publication of the letters and some of the background, career, and character of Archbishop Vigano. In this segment, I want to take a close look uh, at, at the letter. If you were going to summarize two or three of the high points of the letter, where would you start? Well, Father, I guess the most, um, if we can say the most damning thing, really, would be um, the the proof that Archbishop Vigano brings to the table um, of Pope Francis's knowledge of um, ex-Cardinal Theodore McCarrick's um, sinful actions regarding, um, you know, the abuse of um, altar servers and then seminarians and priests. Um, so really, uh, the, the the biggest and uh, the gravest um, point of Archbishop Vigano is is that uh, direct knowledge of the Holy Father, and um, uh, Pope Francis knew these things because Archbishop Vigano told him so personally uh, at Casa Santa Marta in Rome in, um, in I believe 2013. Um, so. Uh, it was actually uh, in June of 2013, um, and so that that is really, um, really uh, of the highest importance for for the church and for the world because we can't we can't pretend. Um, you know, it, it's one thing to to recognize the authority of the Holy Father. But it's quite another to pretend that uh, any pope is a saint, or that any pope is infallible and impeccable. Um, when uh, we know, of course, that a, the pope is only infallible when he when he speaks ex cathedra. So um, it's we don't have the duty. No Catholic has the duty um, of being blindly obedient or of sticking our heads in the sand. Unfortunately, from from all of these reports, and especially from the, this uh, very important testimony of Archbishop Vigano, um, you know, we we basically have the proof that Pope Francis knew what had been going on uh, in the Church, and especially regarding Cardinal or ex Cardinal now at this point McCarrick, and then sent him off, uh, for example, to China because Archbishop Vigano mentions this in in the testimony that. As he was, uh, you know, going in or out of uh, Casa Santa Marta in June of 2013, he encountered then Cardinal McCarrick, who told him that, you know, he was heading off to China, um, you know, to to be kind of the personal envoy or representative of the Holy Father there. And of course, uh, we know that this isn't uh, turning out very well uh, last week and this week because we have these. Uh, you know these updates now regarding uh, the church's uh, position now in China and the re- the recognition of uh, schismatic bishops as being legitimate and basically uh, the betrayal of the of the faithful the underground church for for all of these decades. Right. So, the, 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 um, the, there's a tragedy taking place in China that I, that I hope to discuss on, on a, a later episode. But I want to go back to that date you quoted. It was June of 2013. Right, that, so June twentieth, twenty thirteen. The twentieth. Now, prior to that, uh, Archbishop McCarrick had been under embargo, if you will, imposed by Benedict the sixteenth. Uh, right. No public appearances, no public ministry, no travel, etc. So, in other words, th- there existed in Rome on a piece of at least one piece of paper somewhere documentation regarding the malfeasance uh, of McCarrick. So we, we don't want to erroneously draw the conclusion that this came as a bolt from the blue in, into Rome in, in June of 2013. Right, and, and for example, Father, now Cardinal Leandro Sandri, who was um, you know at the time an archbishop in 2006, 
working as a substitute in the Secretary of State, you know, in his letter to um, a priest of Staten Island, uh, St. Christopher's Parish, Father James Ramsey, um, you know, he acknowledged uh, that that there was this um, this knowledge in the Vatican, in the Secretary of State, for example, of uh, Cardinal McCarrick's actions, and that they had come to know of the testimony of of victims of of then Cardinal McCarrick. So certainly, um, it's not as if um, you know we were led to believe previously that you know no one really knew that the Holy Father didn't know, the top officials in the Vatican didn't know, and that. Uh, even the Archbishop of Washington, Cardinal Donald World, didn't know of these things, and that's just not the case. So, uh, thanks to Archbishop Vigano's testimony um, and and what has come out since then, thanks to that testimony, we know that that that's just not the case. Um, so, we we know then that um, Cardinal, uh, that rather Archbishop Vigano encountered the Holy Father again. Um, and that the Holy Father uh, had asked him uh, not only about his personal opinion of uh, Ben Carnal McCarrick, but also of Archbishop Charles Chaput, the ordinary uh, of, of Philadelphia, and that the Holy Father um, told Archbishop Vigano that that bishops uh, could not be leaning to the right like the Archbishop of Philadelphia. So the Holy Father was already aware of, um, we can say, the theological orientation of Archbishop Chaput, but still um, uh, proceeded to ask Archbishop Vigano as, as if, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to accuse the Holy Father of wanting to trap the Archbishop, but certainly um, he already had a formed opinion on uh, mm-hmm. Archbishop mm-hmm. Uh, Chaput, and he asked also, uh, Archbishop Vigano on October 10th of that same year, 2013, the first year of the Pope's pontificate, uh, what is Cardinal World like? Is he good or bad? And Archbishop Vigano replied, Holy Father, I will not tell you if he is good or bad, but I will tell you two facts. And that was, uh, you know, World's, uh, as Archbishop Vigano called it, pastoral carelessness regarding um what um had been going on at Georgetown University and as well the invitation by the Washington Archdiocese to young men aspiring towards the priesthood to a meeting with Cardinal or then Cardinal McCarrick. So the this, Holy this would Father have been after the embargo things. imposed by Benedict the sixteenth, correct? Yes. Yes. I see. Correct, Father. And okay. um and then uh, there was a an association, a deep friendship, um, and and also on a kind of uh, professional level, we could say, um, between then Cardinal McCarrick with Cardinal Oscar Andres Rodriguez Maradiaga, uh, the Archbishop of Honduras, and they really teamed up to, and as Archbishop Vigano uh, himself called McCarrick as a kingmaker for not only appointments in the Curia, but also the United States. And so as um, as, uh, as uh, Archbishop Vigano explained that the appointments of now Cardinal Blaise Supich to Chicago and now Cardinal Joseph Tobin to Newark, that these uh, had been orchestrated, among others, by Cardinals Maradiaga, Wuerl, and now Archbishop McCarrick. So, so a- after uh, uh, McCarrick came out of exile, uh, he became basically the Pope's representative to a very significant mission in China. And he wasn't just leading the opening prayer at communion breakfasts and, and parish halls. Uh, he was exerting great influence over the ongoing formation uh, of of the American hierarchy. Is that correct? Correct, Father. Um, and this this also had the... Uh, we can say the approval of Cardinal Parolin, Pietro Parolin, who is the current Secretary of State. Um, as Archbishop, descri- as Archbishop Vigano described him as, you know, being complicit in covering up the misdeeds of McCarrick, um, who, after Pope Francis's election, then was kind of, um, we can say, rehabilitated 
de facto mm-hmm. rehabilitated. And then McCarrick proceeded to boast openly of his of his extensive travels and, and missions uh, to various places, including Africa, uh, the Central African Republic, as well as China, and on behalf of the State Department under Obama. On so, behalf of the State Department? R- correct. So oh, he was goodness. also then Archbi- well then Cardinal McCarrick was also involved in in, in these different things. So um, he was uh, McCarrick was was very close to uh, the Obama administration, but that's that's not uh, our topic currently. So we'll right, leave that right. alone. But okay. um, in any case, uh, so Archbishop Vigano goes on to name various prelates in this. Uh, this first testimony of his, dated August 22nd, and these are various men in currently working in the Roman Curia, men very close to Pope Francis, um, like uh, Cardinal Francesco uh, Coco Palmerio and Archbishop Vincenzo Paglia, and um, Cardinal Edwin O'Brien, Cardinal Renato Martino. Um, all of these different men are are kind of uh you know there's an expression in italian in english it would be they're all in the same soup you know they're kind of all uh, working <laughs> with each other um to to further their their own agenda their own right. leftist agenda right peas in a pod uh or birds of, of a feather if you will when we come back we're going to look at the responses and non-responses of archbishop figano's first letter that led to the publication of his second letter we want you to be part of the conversation get in line to call us one 511 5483 stay with us we'll be right back Tune in weekdays from 6 to 7 a.m. Eastern for Sermons for Everyday Living. There's no better way to start your day than with spiritual formation from inspiring priests. For details about upcoming episodes and for podcasts of past shows, visit thestationofthecross.com and click on Sermons for Everyday Living under the Programs tab. That's Sermons for Everyday Living, weekdays from 6 to 7 a.m. Eastern on The Station of the Cross. Help for Down Syndrome Parents. This is a special commentary from the Susan B. Anthony List, named for the suffragette who was proudly pro-life. Kids and adults with Down Syndrome are some of the most loving people on the planet. They don't judge others based on looks or income and have a smile for just about everyone they meet. So why would 90% of Down Syndrome babies be aborted before they ever have a chance to live? Perhaps out of fear of not knowing what to expect, fear of being different. In response, parents of children with Down syndrome are getting more involved to educate women given this diagnosis. To learn more, visit the National Association for Down Syndrome at nads.org. That's nads.org. This is Marjorie Dannenfelser, president of the Susan B. Anthony List. To join us in our battle for life, visit our website at sba-list.org. Between the ninth and 10th weeks of human development in the womb, a burst of growth increases body weight by over 75%. The tiny baby has everything that a newborn baby has. She just needs nutrients and time to grow from that point on. Human life is sacred. Think about it. Coalitionforlife.com You're listening to the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. Call in to the Catholic Current this hour at 1-877-511-5483. If you miss any portion of today's show or want to listen to any past episodes, click the podcast link under the Programs tab at the top of our homepage, thestationofthecross.com. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McKaig of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for The Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and His Catholic Church. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network and the iCatholic Radio app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. Our topic today is 
The Letters of Archbishop Vigano, A Closer Look. Our guest to help us discuss these weighty matters is independent Catholic journalist Brendan Young. We've been talking about Archbishop Vigano, his, his career and his character. We began an analysis of the first letter. And now in this segment, we're going to look uh, on the first part at the responses and non-responses to the letter and how that led to a publication of a, a letter most recently. Brendan, once this was, was all made public, what happened next? Well, Father, the really the only direct response of Pope Francis was um, to, to uh, Archbishop Vigano's testimony was on Sunday, August 26th, heading home um, from Dublin, Ireland, uh, where he was present for the World Meeting of Families, to, um, to the Vatican, to Rome. And, uh, of course, Pope Francis, as, as other popes, usually holds a, a kind of a press conference, a question and answer session on, uh, on these trips home. And um, often these, these, uh, these famous uh, one-liners of, of Pope Francis come out on these trips, um, expressions like, who am I to judge, um, mm-hmm. and, and others. So what was the Pope's response? Well, when he was asked about Archbishop Vigano's testimony, what did the Holy Father say? He said, I will not say one word on this. And he proceeded to tell uh, the journalists to, uh, he said that the document spoke for itself. He encouraged them to read it um, and uh, to to form their own conclusions and that he wasn't going to say anything. But, you know, maybe in the future he would say something after they um they did their due diligence as as uh, as journalists. So uh, basically, it was I will not say a word. Well, hmm. there's um, there's um, a, a, an old Latin adage which translated uh, would be um, "He who remains silent consents," and so um, that's uh, a very powerful um and and actually equitace in, consentit in in Latin that that was mentioned by Archbishop Vigano in his uh in his second document uh which was uh which came out yesterday I believe on September twenty right. seventh, but is actually dated September twenty ninth, the feast of Saint Michael the Archangel. Well, you know, so, Brendan, one of our, our, our listeners had texted in Grace from Loveland, Colorado, said, I find it interesting that n- no contrary evidence uh, has been made available. In other words, no one has produced a stack of documents and said this proves that Vigano is a crank or or an error. Is that correct? There hasn't been any clear evidence to the contrary uh, made available to the public? The that is correct, Father, and it's very telling because when, especially the Vatican wants to deny something, um, when they have the proof, that comes out immediately. It comes out immediately. And we can look back to the past five years of Pope Francis's pontificate in the beginning year or two years. Um, quite often, the Vatican, I don't know if, if you'll remember this, Father, the listeners, but quite often the Vatican would try to clarify statements made by Pope Francis, points mm-hmm. made in his homilies or, or in other places, and they would try to make them seem more orthodox, uh, more doctrinally sound, and eventually they've, they've given up on that. They don't try to clarify these things anymore. Um, the Pope has a mind of his own, and he speaks his own mind, and... and uh, you know, I guess they're just letting him do that now and not trying to do damage control following that. But what's very uh, significant, Father, is that over, and, um, and, and this is telling as well, that over 40 prelates, so bishops, archbishops, cardinals, um, have basically backed Archbishop Vigano up in that they've given him their public support um, and calling for, um, you know, an investigation on, on all levels of the hierarchy, of all levels of the hierarchy, and trying to really come to, come to a, a full awareness of the truth, not to hide anything, um, but really to examine all of these different things that uh, Archbishop Vigano brought up 
and and to get to the bottom of this, as it were. So there have been. Sorry, yeah, I want to interject for a second. Uh, th- there have been some oblique references, I think, in the Vigano letter, Dorina a homily, uh, a reference to Satan as the great accuser now being at work, and then someone else uh, mirroring the silence of the accused Christ. Uh, you were at that Mass, weren't you? I was, Father. I was actually physically present uh, at that Mass on um, September 11th at Casa Santa Marta, and I was about... I don't know, 15 feet away from the Holy Father as he preached that homily, and and I was just um, flabbergasted um, at at that comment. You know, um, it's the Holy. I mean, I was there to to look at the Holy Father um, as he actually said that uh, as it was happening. He said that in these times, it seems like the great accuser has been unchained and is attacking bishops. True, we are all sinners, we bishops. He, that, that refers to, to Satan, the great accuser, tries to uncover the sins so they are visible in order to scandalize the people. Well, uh, unquote. I would disagree, um, because we know that our Lord Jesus Christ, as he himself said, is not only the way and the life, but the truth. He is truth itself, and as the act of faith tells us, a beautiful prayer, that God him, can neither deceive nor be deceived. And so, in the end, the truth, there's an expression in Latin translated, the truth is great and it will prevail. And so if these things are coming to light, it's for the purification of the Church, it's for the love of the Church as the mystical body of Christ. Um, and and I believe personally, Father, and I'm sure many will agree, that it's necessary that unfortunately these terrible sins, as ugly and as um, discouraging as they are, it's necessary that they come to the light so that the Church can be purified, but also so that the Church can regain her credibility. So, um, and, I, and I was there as the Holy Father preached this homily in Italian, and I speak Italian, and so I understood, and this is a faithful translation, what I've read. And um, present also at the Mass were the members of the so-called C9, the Council of Cardinals formed by Pope Francis to advise, to advise him on Church reform, and in the front row there was Cardinal Rodriguez Maradiaga, who was nodding his head. I saw it myself, who was nodding his head in agreement with Pope Francis, um, as he as he uh, made reference to the devil, the great accuser, being the one is responsible for these terrible crimes and sins committed by the clergy, by prelates, uh, coming to the light. And then on September 18th, Father, so a week after, the Pope, um, obviously referring to himself, it's undeniable, um, brought up that it was the people at our Lord's Passion, who yelled, who cried out for his crucifixion. But he went on to say that Jesus then compassionately remained silent because the people were deceived by the powerful ones. And our Lord's response was silence and prayer. The Holy Father said that the shepherd chooses silence when the great accuser accuses him through so many people. Jesus, quote, suffers, offers his life, and prays. So, obviously, the Pope has chosen, uh, by his own volition, for whatever personal aim he has, to remain silent so far, not to respond directly to the points raised by Archbishop Vigano in in his uh, first testimony, and then, of course, now the second testimony has come out. But I believe that the Holy Father is quite mistaken in um, in comparing himself to our Lord. It was... Uh, certainly, um, you know, it, it's with, it would, without any doubt, you know, our Lord is, is God himself, and he chose to be that suffering servant, that he is the Lamb without blemish, and he chose in an unspeakable and indescribable humility to remain silent. But our Lord, we know, is without any stain of sin, without any fault, and is guilty of nothing. Um, that's not the case for human beings. That's not the case for men. And, and among those men, among those sinners, is included the Holy Father himself. Uh, uh, of course. And you know, that, that non-response, 
uh, has generated uh, responses that have gotten big traction in the media. Uh, my good friend and brother in Christ, Jesuit Father Joseph Fessio, the founder of Ignatius Press, I think it was last Sunday, an interview to CNN, uh, referring to uh, Francis's homily, but otherwise silent response to Vigano. Uh, Father Fessio said he's attacking Vigano and everyone who's asking for answers. I just find that deplorable. And he went on to say, be a man, stand up and answer the questions. Those questions haven't been answered, and uh, shortly afterwards, Archbishop Vigano uh, uh, published a, a second letter. Could you? Give, uh, we have about a minute before we need to go to the next segment. Can you give us a really quick summary of what the what was in the second letter? Well, basically, Father, what it is um, is just Archbishop Vigano reiterating the truth of his previous statement, and then emphasizing that the the Holy Father's silence is really um, condemnatory. It's really damning in itself, because um, I know from my own experience that if, if I didn't have a way to defend myself, if I, if I got into trouble, for example, as, as a boy, then I would remain silent, because I didn't want to lie and make things worse, but I also didn't have any way of, of trying to, um, to defend myself or to justify my misbehavior. And then the other part of the second uh, document, Father, is really an appeal on, um, on Archbishop Vigano's part to Cardinal Marc Willet, who was, uh, I believe, the prefect for the Congregation for Bishops in Rome, um, because he and Archbishop Vigano worked closely together, and Archbishop Vigano recalled that Cardinal Willet has, has proof of these different things, uh, and including the sanctions um, of Pope Benedict uh, against Cardinal McCarrick, Ben Cardinal McCarrick, and, uh, and and these different things. So certainly the proof is there; it exists, and uh, it needs to come out. And so Archbishop Vigano has asked the Cardinal to to do so. When we come back, we're going to talk about trying to find a way forward and a way towards healing and hope in these difficult times, in this time of scandal. We want you to be part of the conversation. Get in line to call us now, one 511 5483 Stay with us. We'll be right back. This is the Pope Paul VI Institute Minute with Dr. Tom Hilgers. Why should women continue using the Creighton Model System after learning how to chart their cycles? A well-kept Creighton Model chart is an accurate and very valuable health record that assists NAPR technology-trained physicians in diagnosing and treating women's health problems or diseases. These records can be kept throughout a woman's ever-changing reproductive life, including adolescence, pregnancy, breastfeeding, and the perimenopause. Continued Creighton Model charting also determines the effectiveness of long-term use for achieving and avoiding pregnancy. One woman in our book, Women Heal, described its versatility. I quote, Over the past 13 years, using the Creighton model has taught us to accept our fertility as a precious gift from God. We were able to achieve and avoid pregnancy during the difficult phases of our marriage in a respectful and loving way. End of quote. Discover the Creighton model fertility care system. I'm Dr. Tom Hilgers. Log on to PopePaulVI.com. This is Lavinia Spirito for Catholic Way Bible Study. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus encounters a rich young man who seems very serious about following him. But when the wealthy young man is confronted with the need for total detachment from his possessions, he is saddened. He cannot go through with it. Discipleship is not comfortable. It is costly. Following the Lord Jesus Christ is both the easiest and the hardest thing we will ever do. Easy because we were created for friendship with him, hard because we need to deny our own ways and opinions and live a countercultural witness to the kingdom. Through our free will, we choose to follow him. Through his church, we are equipped. And by his grace, he will see us home with him. Catholic Way Bible Study. Peace, power, purpose. Find out more at cwbs.org. You're listening to the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. Call into the Catholic Current this hour at 1-877-511-5483. 
Shortly after today's show, visit our page for The Catholic Current at thestationofthecross.com. Here you'll find a link to Father McTague's recommended reading list and a link for downloading the program so that you can share it with your family and friends. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for The Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and His Catholic Church. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network and the iCatholic Radio app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. Our topic today is... The Letters of Archbishop Vigano, A Closer Look. And our guest to help us with this weighty matter is independent Catholic journalist Brendan Young. In this segment, we're going to talk a bit more about uh, the the second letter of Archbishop Vigano and also how we, uh, as people of faith, can find a path to healing and hope and renewal. Brendan, we have a caller on the line. We have Nancy from Boston. Nancy, welcome to The Catholic Current. Thank you. And thank you for uh, covering this very important topic. What do you have to say to us today? Um, So in 2002, um, when I went to World Youth Day Toronto, I received a very strong call. This was um, right after the scandal broke in Boston, and I am uh, part of the Church of Boston. Um, I... I had wanted to leave the church because I was so disgusted by the atrocities. And I was uh, leading uh, a tri-parish youth ministry with responsibility for 950 youth. So I knew I had been called to ministry, and I was really in a faith crisis. And for nine months, I prayed every day, asking God to leave the church. And um, when World Youth Day Toronto, you know, obviously I never got that answer, and um, mm-hmm. when World Youth Day came, I said, all right, Lord, I'm going to go to Toronto because I want to speak to you. You need to tell me what to do. And uh, during the miracle of Pope John Paul II that happened at World Youth Day, um, it was a mini hurricane blew in and 60-mile-an-hour um, mm-hmm. winds. It was crazy. His opening sentence was, Holy Spirit, come and renew the work that was begun with the waters of baptism. And as soon as he said it, finished it, it all stopped. 60-mile-an-hour winds, pelting rain, and I thought, oh, my word, I'm living the Fatima miracle. And then what came to me um, was, who is this that the window bays, what he says? And what came to me is, he's the Vicar of Christ. And I felt God saying, I'm going to renew the church, and I'm going to do it under the Vicar of Christ. And I was like, okay, Lord, I'm not going to leave. I'm going to stay. I'm going to help you. And um, the next year, I contacted Barbara Thorpe, who was in charge of the... She was newly uh, appointed by Cardinal Sean, who was then Bishop Sean, and uh, for an office for healing and prevention. And I called her, and she's like, yeah, I'd definitely like to meet with you. So we we started planning. And for two years, um, we we prayed Eucharistic Adoration to let God form this ministry. And what came out of prayer in front of the Eucharist was a call to repentance for the sins of the scandal. And this was really a consistent call, because at that point, Cardinal Sean was also discerning this, and he was discerning... Is there a name of the ministry? Was there a ministry formed? Is there a name for this? It's called City of God. It's called City City of God, God. yep. Okay. And and I actually got um, a letter from Pope Benedict XVI in 2008, Um, so... um, after this call to repentance came, I had a, uh, I developed cancer, oh, and, uh, in 2007, uh, stage three. I should be dead, but miraculously, I was healed through the intercession of Pope John Paul II. But I, I felt called to offer my cancer as a form of redemptive suffering and reparation for the scandal. And as I started, hundreds started following me. So we got a prayer um, from from uh, Medjugorje, Consecration to the Cross Prayer, and we put it on a prayer sheet, and the prayer for grace... Uh, Nancy, I, I need to intervene uh, here, because okay. about conscious of the passage so of time. Is there a website? And um, is there a no, website no, for the City has, of God? Nope. This has spread person to person. So what we do is, any suffering that comes, we offer it up. We stub our toe, we're stuck in traffic. Whatever comes, we offer it up in reparation for our sins, sins of the scandal, and we pray... Oh, Nancy, through. God bless you for, for your, your generosity and, and your, your goodwill. We pray for John Paul II for the healing of, the, of the, those hurt 
in any way by the scandal. The direct thank you, thank you very very much. Victim. You know, we we need people who are willing to take up their crosses. You know, Fulton Sheen said, "Don't let good suffering uh, go to waste." And 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 Nancy uh, is 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 making good use of of suffering. Thanks be to God, uh, Brendan. Um, on your view, you know we're, we're caught in a, in a spiritual war right now. What resources do we have available? Well, Father, that's a that's a really good question. Um, you know, something that comes to mind, uh, particularly for uh, victims of of trauma and, and abuse, including sexual abuse, um, is uh, an apostolate, a confraternity that was formed uh, in. Uh, about five years ago or so in in Ireland uh, by the Benedictine monks of perpetual adoration at Silverstream Priory. And that confraternity is called the Confraternity of Jesus, King of Love. And um, that's um, based on a devotion which was revealed to an Augustinian canonist uh, in France in the 1920s, uh, Mother Yvonne Aimé de Malestroit, and um, that confraternity, if you just Google the confraternity of Jesus, King of Love, it's not just for abuse victims, but uh, it's a very, very powerful apostolate, and um, it helps in the uh, regaining or the restoration of innocence um, that is uh, that it has been lost, for example, in childhood or stolen or defiled. Mm. And uh, it's... it's um, a powerful source of truly healing grace. So I encourage anyone interested, not just abuse survivors, um, but uh, but everyone, uh, to all adults, uh, to look into joining that confraternity. The the uh, it's not um, very involved. Uh, the obligation is simply re- re- uh, reciting a very short prayer, um, morning and evening. Uh, Jesus, King of Love, I. I put my trust in thy loving mercy. And I have a, a, a little statue here that I brought back from my trip to Ireland last month of, of Jesus, King of Love, it's just a beautiful representation of the child Jesus. So I would encourage anyone who's looking for healing to, to look into that confraternity. But Father, we'll, really We'll make what, that, that website uh, available on uh, the reading list uh, after, after the program. We'll make sure that our, our sure. listeners can find it. Thank you. But really what, what comes to mind and what I had mentioned last week was the absolute necessity of, uh, of Our Lady, and particularly of the message of Fatima. Because as Our Lady told the children uh, of Fatima, she said, only Our Lady of the Rosary, referring to herself, can help you. Mm-hmm. And we're in this mess today because the, uh, really the message of Fatima has been so ignored, uh, downplayed and ignored, and all of her all of her requests made at Fatima, or subsequent to those six operations in 1917, but still forming part of the Fatima message, have gone unfulfilled. Namely, the consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary by the Pope and all of the bishops, all of the Catholic bishops of the world. So we need to focus on being faithful to our daily rosary, of making the five first Saturdays, uh, of reparation to the Immaculate Heart, of wearing the brown scapular, of doing our daily duty, of modesty and dress, all of these different things that she's asked of us time and again in, in various revelations and apparitions, but particularly in the message of Fatima, which has received uh, not only uh, ecclesiastical approbation, but uh, of course we can't forget that all of this was confirmed uh, the, Nancy, I believe, the caller had mentioned something about reliving the Fatima miracle. Well, really, the miracle of the Son was the greatest miracle to take place after the resurrection of our Lord. It was witnessed by 70,000 people. I mean, the Son literally spun. So we can't uh, equivocate or compare anything to that miracle of the Son mm-hmm. because it was just so powerful. And that was heaven's sign of the importance of the necessity of the authenticity of Fatima, and we really need to get back to basics, and really um, that's prayer and penance, particularly the daily prayer of the Holy Rosary. And so anyone looking for more information on Fatima, please visit www.fatima.org. And if you haven't heard about Fatima, or if you've only heard parts about Fatima, really 
reacquaint yourself or acquaint yourself with the message, uh, just visit that website. It's very basic, it's simple, but it's beautiful and it's powerful. So again, www.fatima.org. You know, Brendan, some uh, prominent Catholics ha- have suggested that, uh, that this is a problem for bishops and cardinals and, and the Pope to fix, and that you know ordinary folks in the pew don't need to do any self-examination, don't need to perform any penance. This this is not their problem. What, what do you think about that? Well, Father, I would only uh, quote our Lord himself when he told us in the Gospel that unless we do penance, we will likewise perish. Penance isn't just for the clergy or religious, it's for all of us. And we need to do all that we can, as requested by our Lord and Our Lady, um, primarily in the Gospel and then through throughout uh, history and various revelations and apparitions. We need to do penance. We need to make reparation. Uh, as Our Lady of La Salette told us in 1846, she couldn't restrain her son's arm of justice from falling any longer. It was way too heavy. Um, And then again in 1917, Our Lady of Fatima told us that men must cease offending the Lord our God. He is already too much offended. So all of us, all of us as Christians, have this duty and need to do penance to make reparation because the sacred and immaculate hearts of Jesus and Mary are offended in unspeakable ways. And so all of us need to do our part in following the gospel that is Christ crucified and doing penance. And the most important penance or way of making reparation is simply doing our daily duty. We don't need to wear a hair shirt. We don't need to scourge ourselves. But yes, uh, certainly fasting uh, in moderation, as approved by our spiritual director or confessor, just doing our daily duty, taking the trash out, making our bed, um, you know, things like this, the simple things, that's that's the key to this, Father. Doing simple things with great love and also committing to a really stubborn, militant intercession, praying for those whose hearts may have been hardened by sin, by blindness, by addiction or illusion, And all of us, uh, we all need to repent. We all have something to grieve over. We all have offended our Lord in some way. We can't kid ourselves about that. Through the intercession of Our Lady Mount Carmel, may the Lord protect you from all harm and every evil till you reach the happiness of heaven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, go in peace. Please pray for me. Thank you for listening to this podcast brought to you by the Station of the Cross. The Station of the Cross is a listener-funded nonprofit organization. If this podcast has helped you in your spiritual journey, please consider making a donation. Donations can be made through our website, thestationofthecross.com, or by calling 1-877-888-6279. You can also donate right through our free iCatholic Radio mobile app. Thank you for listening to and supporting the Station of the Cross, proclaiming the fullness of truth with clarity and charity.